a very warm welcome to you all uh, to our service here of worship and the word here in the Pilgrim Parishes. And as temperatures have plunged this week, I do indeed pray that you have been able to keep warm. Well, today in our service, we'll be hearing in one of our readings of the Transfiguration of Christ. And of course, today is also Valentine's Day. So we will be picking up uh, both of those themes in this service. And also later on, we will be having some very important news uh, from our church wardens. But before we start with our opening hymn, let's join together in words of praise to God from Psalm 100. So I invite you to join with me. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. with our Heavenly Father this morning, I invite you now to 
say sorry to him for all the things that are in your life that you know are displeasing to him as we join together in these words of corporate confession. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us and care for us all the time. We know that this week we have not always lived the way you tell us. We have done wrong things and not done all the good things we should have done. Only you can save us, so please forgive us and help us to live as your friends. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I now hand us over to Amy for our children's activity for this morning. I hope you're well. So today's main theme is love, and obviously it's Valentine's Day, so it's natural to think of the people that we love and the people that love us. Maybe the first people you think of are from your family or your friends. But what about God? The Bible tells us that God is love, and that he loves us more than we could ever possibly imagine. Now, I wanted a craft today that would remind us of God's love for us. So, I have created a love heart, but not just any love heart. This is a looking glass mirror love heart, so that every time you look in it, you can remind yourself of just how much God loves you, and the fact that he loves you just as you are. He made you to be the way that you are, and he loves you just like that. Now, I've made this using two pieces of red card and some tin foil. And you want to cut both pieces of card and the tin foil to the same heart shape. One of the pieces of card, then you just leave as a solid heart shape and stick the foil on top of it. And that creates your back and the middle part. Then the third piece of red card, you want to cut an inner heart shape out of the middle. This is a little bit tricky, so you might need an adult to help you with that, and be very careful with the scissors. Then you're going to stick this cut-out heart on top of the other two, so you end up with kind of three layers. And then I've just finished it off by sticking a lollipop stick onto the back. And that's your finished heart-shaped mirror. So whenever you look in it, you can just be reminded of how loved you are. You might even want to write around the edge, God loves me, or God is love, just to remind you even more. So I hope you have lots of fun making that, and I hope to see you soon. Take care, bye! Thank you very much, Amy. Psalm 115 verse 1 declares, Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory, because of your love and faithfulness. So let's declare that now as we sing this worship song together. Your love so great Jesus in all things I've seen a glimpse of your heart A billion years Creation core. 
is from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 9, the Transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then the cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they would no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Reading from Second Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 3 to 6. Present weakness and resurrection life. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory 
displayed in the face of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Let's pray. May I speak and may we listen in the power of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Whether we choose to celebrate it or not, today is St. Valentine's Day, a day on which people in the UK and across the world spend millions of pounds on temporary gestures of love including apparently in this country about 198 million roses, all in pursuit of or celebration of love. Now, sadly, the flowers will wilt, the chocolates will be eaten and be nothing more than their wrappers, and even the ink on those carefully written cards will fade. Contrast this, if you will, to God's love. God's love which lasts an eternity. The gospel is God's valentine to the world. God didn't spend millions of pounds sending us all little trinkets. Instead, he sent us his most precious possession, his son, Jesus Christ. Now, John 3.16 sums up our gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. Now, some clever person saw this phrase in those verses. Today is also the Sunday that's set aside for us to think about the transfiguration. Now, lots of us know this story really well, but it's always good to get things back to the front of our minds and to think over things again. So the accounts in the Gospels begin six days later, or a few days later, Jesus took Peter, James and John up a high mountain to pray. A few days later. That's telling us to look back and see what happened a few days earlier. And when we look back, we see that Jesus had been walking with his disciples towards one of the villages. And as he walked, he said to them, who do people say I am? Then they answered. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, one of the prophets. And Jesus asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this is the context for this story. The transfiguration is Jesus proving to his three closest friends exactly who he really is. Now, they'd been with him, they'd travelled around, they'd seen his miracles, but the transfiguration shows not just his human side, but his divine side. They see it and they begin to grasp for themselves exactly who Jesus truly is. So they climb this mountain to pray, something they've no doubt done many, many times before. But this time, something incredible happens. Jesus is transfigured, transformed. His face is radiant. His garments have changed. They're described by the Greek word meaning glistening or gleaming like burnished brass or gold in the glare of sunlight. This is the same description that the Bible uses to describe angels. Now, I love the descriptions of their clothing. To me, they're like first century adverts for washing powder. 
Matthew says, as white as light. Mark says, dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And Luke describes Elijah and Moses. He says, in glorious splendor, their faces shining as bright as a flash of lightning. Now I wonder what the brightest light you've ever seen is. The nearest thing that I can come to imagining this is that some years ago when I was driving on the M6, I, my car was hit by lightning. And there it was enveloped in this such a bright light, this sort of purpley, almost ultraviolet light, incredibly bright, only lasted fortunately a few seconds but for them this light went on shining and then if that's not enough Elijah and Moses appeared have you ever thought stop to think how did they know that these people were Moses and Elijah they'd never seen them there was no video clips of them or photographs how did they instantly know that this was indeed Elijah and Moses. Does this actually tell us a little glimpse of heaven? Maybe when we are in heaven, we will just know people. There won't need to be any more awkward introductions. But I digress. The disciples knew the human Jesus. They'd seen so much of what he was capable of, but now... They were seeing for themselves the divine side. And incredibly, as they also see Elijah and Moses, they see their great heroes of Jewish faith. Moses was the Old Testament lawgiver. Elijah, the first and greatest of the prophets. And through this, we're being shown that Jesus is not Elijah. He's not Moses. He's not just another prophet. Jesus is far more than the law and the prophets. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And I love the fact that good old Moses finally makes it to the promised land. Isn't that a lovely little touch? And then Peter the impetuous opens his mouth, doesn't he, and says the first thing that comes to his mind as he offers to make three tents or booths for these people. He's babbling, isn't he? And I love the fact that when Mark records this incident in his gospel, he almost tries to excuse him by saying he didn't know what to say. He was so afraid. And it's these little phrases in the gospel that show us the truth of the gospel. These little giveaway phrases that give them the total sense of actually having happened. And then immediately they're covered in a cloud and they hear the voice of God saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Now, these are the last words that we hear God speak. And so they're vitally important. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. This showed the disciples who Jesus really was. It also encourages Jesus that he's doing the right thing. Press on. All history depends on this. Keep going. You're going the right way. You're doing the right thing. And often in Jewish thought, a cloud represents the presence of God. Have a think back of the other stories that you can recall where there is a cloud. Moses met God in a cloud. God came to the tabernacle in a cloud. A cloud filled the temple when Solomon dedicated it. And here the disciples are meeting not just Jesus, but God 
the Father. I'm not surprised they were frightened and fell to the floor. And suddenly, there's no one around. There's just Jesus who's helping them up and telling them not to worry. Not to worry. Imagine if that was the experience that we just have. I think we'd be a little bit worried. But what an incredible experience. Peter, James and John are totally changed by this experience. Now they know that they know that they know that Jesus really is the Son of God. And in the first chapter of John's Gospel, John alludes to this meeting, this experience. He says, we have seen his glory the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. But all too soon, this little glimpse of glory is over. And as they walk back down the mountain, Jesus says something really hard to them. He asks them not to tell anyone what they've seen. Isn't that tough? They've just had probably the most incredible experience of their lives. Has to be the most incredible experience of their lives. They're probably bursting to go home and tell their friends and their families. But no, they're sworn to secrecy for now. So what does this amazing revelation teach us? Well, it's intended to show us Jesus is not just a good teacher. He's not just a prophet. Jesus is the Son of God. And in the same way that Jesus questioned his disciples, so today he questions each of us. So who do you say that I am? Who do you say I am? And each of us needs our own response to the transfiguration. Now, the Greek word for transfigured is metamorpho, for which we get our word metamorphosis. That, like the incredible change that happens to a caterpillar as it becomes a moth or a butterfly. And there are only two other times that this word is used. Firstly, it's used in Romans, And it says we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And then it's used in 2 Corinthians 3. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are ever being transformed into his likeness. We are being called to reflect the Lord's glory. That is an incredible calling for each and every one of us. And when we become Christian, we acknowledge for ourselves that Jesus is our Lord. We're repentant. We're sorry for all that we've done wrong. But it's not quite enough just to believe in God. We have to go on being transformed. We have to undergo our own metamorphosis. There are no shortcuts. We need to spend time in prayer and worship, time together when we can, time to serve God with our lives. And through all of this, the Holy Spirit starts to do an incredible work until even me, even little me, it begins to reflect a little of the glory of Christ. And that is reflected to the people around me. Hopefully they start to see some change. They start to ask questions. Our transfiguration points them to Jesus, points them to God. Now, just as this story marks a changing point in the Gospels, and from this point, The focus becomes on Jerusalem and ultimately to the crucifixion and resurrection. So this reading is set in the week that we begin our journey through Lent. We begin our 40 days 
of our focus looking towards the cross and the resurrection. And maybe in the next 40 days, God wants to do a little transforming in each of us. Now, we've had a year of giving up so much, haven't we? Maybe this Lent, we're not being called to give up anything. Maybe to take on something. Maybe to pray a little bit more. Maybe to read something. Maybe to join a Lent group. There are still spaces, still time to sign up for a Lent course um, and there are lots of examples of the ones that you could join on this week's Pilgrim Post. But what about finding a book? What about making a decision to read something through Lent? I've chosen a few. I've chosen to go through Mark's Gospel with N.T. Wright. I've chosen a book, Encouragement from the Psalms, a 40-day devotional journey. We certainly need some encouragement at the moment, don't we? And I've also chosen to look again at Paula Gooder's journey to the empty tomb. You've still got some time. Don't leave it until Ash Wednesday to start thinking about Lent. What are you going to do in the next 40 days that the Holy Spirit may begin to transfigure you? Also watch out. We know when Jesus went into the 40 days in the wilderness, he was tempted by the devil. How does Satan work? He likes to distract us. He deceives us. He discourages us. So if you fall and if you fail, don't worry. Pick yourself up. Dust yourself down. Straighten your crown and start again. And little by little, each of us will be undergoing our own transformation, our own metamorphosis, our own transfiguration. Now remember the words of the fantastic hymn that we sang together at the start of this service, Love Divine. And it ends with the words, changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love and praise. This is God's love for us. It's all about guiding us and preparing each of us for an eternity with him. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you allowed the disciples to witness this amazing sight. Come by your Holy Spirit and gently show us areas of our lives that you would like to work on and transform. Would you continue to challenge us to surrender more of our lives to you this Lent and going forward? Help us to draw closer to you that each of us might truly reflect your glory to those around us. Amen.
over to our church wardens for a very important and exciting announcement. Good morning. On behalf of the uh, church wardens of the Pilgrim Parishes, I'm delighted to announce the appointment of the Reverend Sue Hurley as the new priest in charge, effective as soon as the bishop is able to license Sue in this new role. This, by the way, follows a rigorous process and a lengthy interview by a panel which included representatives from all the parishes that make up the Pilgrim Parishes. A representative from the Church Pastoral Aid Society as our patron, as well as the area dean and the archdeacon. I'm pleased to report that the panel voted unanimously to appoint Sue. Not all of us will know Sue well, given that as the curate for Stebbing, appointed by the Reverend Tim Goodbody, her focus has been mainly on this part of the Pilgrim Parishes. But as our new priest in charge, Sue is now looking forward to getting to know us all better. With eight churches and a Church of England primary school amongst her new responsibilities, Sue will need all our support as well as the help of the ministry team. Please welcome Sue and her husband Andy as she assumes this new and important role. Sue and Andy are pleased to continue to live in the rectory in Little Eastham and look forward to supporting the annual Council of Warwick Country Show, which as you know takes place around the rectory on the August bank holiday weekend. We pray that God will anoint and bless her afresh in furthering the kingdom of God in the pilgrim parishes. Please pray for Sue as she enthusiastically assumes this new role. Thank you. Good morning. I know I speak on behalf of firstly the ministry team of the pilgrim parishes and secondly the deanery chapter when I say how thrilled we are to have our friend and colleague Sue appointed as priest in charge of the Pilgrim Parishes. Over the last five years, we have got to know, respect and love Sue and to recognise her ability to lead gently, teach wisely and to bring people to maturity of spirit and holiness of life. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, for all those whom you have called through the centuries to serve in the ministry of the church. Pour your blessing on your servant Sue, that by word and deed she may bear witness to your saving love and power and enable your people to grow up into him who is the head, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and honour for ever. Amen. I'm Philip Hawkes, a church warden at Linsell. We, the Church of Linsell, welcome you, Sue, as our new incumbent. And we're mindful you're already much a part of our existing church community. Now we learn that you are our newly appointed head of the Pilgrim Parishes, we welcome you to that role, supported by Andy, Ella and Toby. We pray for you all as you plan your life as leader 
to develop a half of the community within the totality of the pilgrim parishes. May, may God bless you all. I'm Helen Davis. I'm one of the church wardens in Little Sailing Church. And on behalf of the parishes of Great and Little Sailing, we welcome Sue to lead us forward in this benefice. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon Sue. We thank you for the gifts and talents you have bestowed upon her to fulfill her mission in this benefice. May we be generous in our welcome and ever grateful for her ministry. May we, with her, grow ever more deeply, both spiritually and socially, in service to others and to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Chris Bevan, and I am one of the church wardens for Stebbing. And I was on the interviewing panel as well. So um, great pleasure to be here today with some great news. So um, let us pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father of each and every one of us, at this very exciting and challenging time, we pray for your blessings in abundance on the pilgrim parishes. May we strive to work together to establish your kingdom in this place. May we truly love our neighbours as ourselves and use our God-given gifts graciously bestowed on each of us to complete the whole body of Christ and to his glory. May we be people of curiosity and try not to hold on to control and the past, but to be open to your loving guidance and to spread your word to enrich all those who we meet. May we thrive and flourish in every area of our God-given lives. We especially pray for a very special blessing and anointing on Sue and Andy. Give Sue wisdom and discernment and equip her with all that she needs as she seeks to lead pilgrim parishes in your ways. We pray for protection for them and for their family. May we all join as one in peace and harmony as we have been called to do so. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Well, great news that is. Uh, very exciting news as we welcome Sue as our new priest in charge. Yet one more thing to give thanks and praise to God for. The Psalm 106 verse 48 declares, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. So let's do that now as we sing together.
words, Lord, in your mercy, the response is, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, at the Transfiguration, you showed Jesus in a new state of glory and gave his disciples a glimpse of what they would see in his risen life. As we worship together week by week, help us to get a glimpse of your heavenly kingdom, as well as a deeper understanding of how your son Jesus can transfigure our broken and unfulfilled lives. On this St Valentine's Day, we come before you with our prayers and rejoice in the wonder and power of your never-ending love for everyone in your kingdom and our love for you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, give your wisdom and heavenly grace to our bishops, Gully and Roger, and to all others who hold office in your church, that by their service, that by their service, faith may abound and your kingdom increase. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate God, we lift to you those we hold in our hearts, praying for their health, their well-being and their sense of hope. We pray that even when loved ones cannot physically be together, they do not feel apart. We pray for you to help us in our communicating, our connecting and our caring. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for all those involved in the nurturing, education and well-being of young lives. We give thanks for the commitment of teachers and all those involved in serving young people and children in education. We pray that all lives can flourish, even in these difficult times, and that no one is overlooked. We pray for a calm and sensible approach to awarding grades for public examinations this year. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, as we pray for your world, we ask that you take from us all hatred and prejudice. Give us the spirit of love for all people, whatever their race or creed, and give the same spirit of acceptance to all world leaders, that through mutual understanding and common endeavour, peace and prosperity may be increased throughout the world. We give thanks for the vaccination rollout in the United Kingdom. We pray for all world leaders working with the World Health Organization to coordinate the supply and rollout of the coronavirus vaccination programs to the poorer nations of the world. We pray that all nations work, may work together for the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Caring God, we lift to you the elderly, vulnerable and isolated. We pray for their deliverance, protection and comfort. And we pray for those who care for them, that they may be strengthened and encouraged by your love. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. 
loving God, with the grace of your Holy Spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow, need, sickness or adversity. We pray for those who suffer persecution for their faith and those for whom death draws near. Give consolation to those in sorrow or mourning. And as you take them into your tender care, may they be strengthened by the power of your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, as we move into the coming week, help us to take with us all that we have heard during our time together this morning. May what we have heard provide encouragement and inspiration to carry on your work. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we conclude our service with a blessing and with a song that's entitled Transfiguration, I just wish you all a very good week. Please do keep safe. And of course, please pray for both Sue and Andy as Sue prepares to be formally licensed in a few months' time as our new priest in charge. And so... You are called and loved by God the Father and kept safe by Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace and love be yours in abundance from God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah!